Call us now at 850-660-9595. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker. Shalom, shalom. Good morning to all of you this beautiful Thursday morning, August the 25th, 2022, as we gather together for Revealing the Truth, where we talk about the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and today is our Revelation study as we continue each week through the book of Revelation. We are now, I think, in episode four. And you'll be able to catch up on all the prior episodes in sequence on our YouTube channel. So we hope that you will tune in there. We are grateful for you to be with us today. And we are delighted that our phone lines are available and open for you to call at 850-660-9595. If you're a first-time caller, there's a new fresh copy, signed copy of 315, the Genesis of All Prophecy that we're happy to give you as a gift. So please give us a call and comment about the program, talk about what's on your heart and what's on your mind. Uh, There's no call that's uh, unimportant. If you have a prayer request, a prayer need, that's what we're here for. This is ministry and we are uh, part of the larger Igniting a Nation Ministries. This is just the media branch, and we operate uh, an outreach in Kisi, Kenya, where the Igniting a Nation Worship Center houses some 175 wonderful souls who gather together each week to worship the Lord and to study these teachings. So Pastor Job Ezekiel has been very faithful to follow along uh, to every teaching and to pass along the message to the flock there, as well as our work in outreach in Israel. Uh, What you are watching is simulcast from 10 a.m., from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., Monday through Friday, on all our social media channels. And you can listen to the program 24 hours a day, seven days a week on iHeartRadio, the Igniting a Nation apps, and IgnitingNation.com via the website. These two hours are simulcast. The rest of the day uh, is just audio and is available on all those other outlets. So if you want to catch up on 20 years worth of sermons and teachings and new teachings that are out there, then uh, stay tuned. Keep your, your, uh, I guess the old expression was keep your dial tuned, uh, but keep your app open and listen anytime you want. There is a whole uh, list of, uh, of uh, over 500 right now audio uploads uh, that are available to you that play every hour on the hour. Uh, if you are interested in anything that you hear and you want to hear the rest of it, uh, because many of the programs that we air are part of a larger series. So you might tune in and find that you are on uh, part 23 of a larger series and you're very interested in it, but you'd like to start from the beginning. That's available to you. Just visit IgnitingNation.com and go to the Biblical Truth Library. There you can find all of the teachings are already there in audio and in video. And you can download them, use them for your own purpose, and study as your own pace determines. We are delighted that you are with us and delighted that you are watching and continue to support the ministry. We would not be able to be on the air without you. We would not be able to continue the work we're doing, both in Northwest Florida and throughout the United States, as well as in Kenya and in Israel. We also are grateful for our sponsors, the Don Burt team at Keller Williams Emerald Coast and Navarre Chiropractic Center. In both cases, I have personal experience uh, with both of these wonderful groups of people. Don Burt and her team helped me through every aspect of home acquisition imaginable over the past three years and continues to provide support to me wherever I have a need. 
She and her team have been serving the needs of both military and civilian clients for many years and is truly loved by all. If you're even thinking about relocating to the beautiful Emerald Coast or considering a move of any kind in Northwest Florida, give Dawn and her team a call at 850-684-4284 and check them out online at www.teambert.com. And of course, our great friends at Navarre Chiropractic. I was just there yesterday and uh, happy to tell you that uh, the incredible work that uh, Dr. Laird Likens is doing and his entire team is fully engaged in the process. It's, it's watching uh, almost a symphony. It's, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful way of handoff from one to another as they focus on a holistic approach that incorporates every technique from classical adjustment to acupuncture, heat therapy, traction, massage, personal trainers to make sure you get the best care possible. This full service practice should be your first stop after a car accident or any injury to your body. No insurance, no worries. They have a plan to accommodate any situation. Give them a call right now at 850 939-3339 939-3339 and look them up online at NavarreChiropracticCenter.com. I'm excited. I'm excited because so much is happening around us, swirling around us. The last uh, couple of days, we have been really focusing a lot on prophecy. And that's one of my personal passions, although I don't write books related to prophecy, although uh, this last book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy, was really the, uh, yeah, I guess my, uh, what, would, what would you call it? Uh, uh, my one and only, I believe, attempt to encapsulate uh, the import of prophecy and why the church at large needs to embrace prophecy and see the connection from the earliest point in the Garden of Eden, taking us all the way through to Revelation 22 when we return to that Garden of Eden. And if you want to know the path that we've taken and how far off that path we've gone, then this is the book to get because it not only tells you what's happened, but it also tells you what we need to do in order to get this ship back on course. Now, the ship is going to crash and burn. We know that. But what we do as a people, what we do as a body is important. And what we do today as a body is important. So as we study the book of Revelation, which is the what was, what is, and what is to come vision that God gave to John. It was a revelation of Messiah. 315 is a revelation of Messiah. And so when God talks about what was, what is, and what is to come, he starts us out in the very first prophecy, and he sets the tone for all future prophecy. And then he gives us the last book, the book of Revelation, that confirms what he told us in Genesis 3.15. And so the entirety of scripture is really built around a theme of the revelation of Messiah in many different approaches how we are going about setting the stage for the return of Messiah. So let's jump right in. John received the revelation of Yeshua Messiah, which God gave unto him. Here is the divine order of transmission. God gave the revelation to Yeshua, and it was sent and signified, made known to his servant, the apostle John, from Revelation 1, 1, 4, 9, and 22 and 8. The purpose of this revelation was to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. 
Now, I know that there are many who would say that uh, these things didn't come to pass and they were supposed to come shortly. That's man imposing man's view of time on God. If we were the inventors, if we were the creators of time, that would be one thing. However, we didn't create time, God did. And so short in God's time may be extremely long in our time. But yet literally in every generation has been the ex expectation of Messiah coming. That's our heart's desire. That as we see how far we've fallen, have we fallen further than Sodom and Gomorrah? No. Have we fallen further than the debauchery of the Roman Empire? No. Do we think we're a better generation, a more godly generation, a less sinless generation than generations in the past? The truth is no. We're pretty much all the same. There's just as much idol worship today as the day that God called Abraham out of idol worship. Look at the multiplicity of religions in the world and ideologies in the world. And how many are surrounded by statues and icons and things that are truly worship, believing that they are a transport, a messenger, a vehicle in which to reach God. Inanimate objects being given power. And so really, has anything changed in 6,000 years? And I would tell you that the human condition, once we look at Genesis 3.15 and what we would consider to be the fall of man, nothing has changed. Oh, technology has changed. But truly, the human condition, the wars, the famine, the oppression, the persecution, has any of that changed? Have we gone any period, extended period of time, where there was peace on earth and goodwill toward man? And I'm not... A skeptic. I'm not a uh, a uh, pessimist. I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a joy-filled, happy person, embracing life and enjoying what God has given. But yet, facing the reality of the human condition that we have fallen from a nation sold out for God, seventy-five, eighty percent of America, believing in God, down into the maybe one third, even believe in God. Is this not going back to the ways of old? And so God took us on a path to tell us that this is where we were headed. And We've arrived, but yet there's more to come. The purpose of this revelation was to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Could shortly be 2,000 years? Absolutely. We have no idea what God considers to be long or short. All we actually know is that there's 24 hours in a day. That's the measurement of time he has given us. 30 days in a month based on a lunar calendar. That's the measure of time he has given us. 
But since he is the author of time, he can make time stand still as he did. He can accelerate time. He can de-accelerate time. Or as time marches on, our perspective on time changes. The older you get, the more time plays a role in your focal point of your life. It was given so the people would know what will happen in the future. You see, shortly is just a figure of speech that says not now. It doesn't say when, it just says not now. This powerful revelation came to John in one of the darkest times of his life. Divine revelation often comes in difficult times. It was in exile that Jacob saw God at Bethel, Genesis 35 and 1. It was in exile that Moses met God at the burning bush, Exodus 3, 1 and 2. It was in exile that Elijah heard the voice of God in 1 Kings 19, 3 and 9. It was in exile that Ezekiel saw the glory of God, Ezekiel 1 and 3. It was an exile that Daniel saw his vision of God, Daniel 7 and 9. If you're going through a difficult time in your life, you can either succumb to depression or pity, or you, like the Apostle John, can get in the spirit and begin to worship God. Reflect for a moment, if you will, what might God be trying to birth through you or reveal to you in your darkest hour? And for many of you watching, for many of you listening, this may be your darkest hour. This may be a time of hopelessness when it's really a time that God wants to use for revelation. In Revelation, Yeshua is described in many ways. In 1 1, he's Yeshua Messiah. In 1 5, he's the faithful witness. In 1 5, he's the first begotten of the dead. In 1 5, he's the prince of kings of the earth. In 1 8, he's the Alpha and Omega. 1 17, he's the first and the last. 1 13, he's the Son of Man. 2 18, he's the Son of God. Three and seven, he's the keeper of David's keys. And 118, he's the keeper of keys of hell and death. In verse five and five, he's the lion of Judah. And five and five, he's the root of David. And five and six, he's the slain lamb. And six, 16 to 17, he's the angry lamb. And seven, 17, he's the tender lamb. And 11 and eight, He's our Lord. In 12 and 5, he's the man child. In 15, 3, he's the king of saints. In 19, 11, he's faithful and true. In 19, 13, he's the word of God. In 19, 16, he's the king of kings. In 19, 16, he's the Lord of lords. In 22 and 13, he is the beginning and the end. In 22, 16, he is the bright and morning star. This really speaks to the compound unity of God. I know the doctrine of the Trinity. We've talked many times about it. But this should impress upon you all these attributes, but there's just one Yeshua. And he is all these things, but he is but one Yeshua, a compound unity. He and God are one with the Holy Spirit. This is the compound unity of God manifesting itself in unique and distinct ways. But yet, so many 
attributes, so many aspects that this idea of taking God and dividing him in three parts makes it more understandable, but it doesn't, in my mind, negate the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, a singular one, a compound unity. The key to understanding the book of Revelation is to realize it's a revelation about Messiah. The key to understanding 315, Genesis 315, it is a, re it is a revelation about Yeshua, Messiah, the seed of the woman. Make no mistake that these two books are indelibly connected and can never be separated because they are the same revelation. This is the beginning of the revelation. This is the fulfillment of the revelation. And every chapter and every book in between, Genesis and Revelation, leads us on a path to follow the seed line of Messiah to its final culmination. Revelation 19.10 declares, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. This is a tremendous spiritual key to understanding prophecy, the entire word of God, the living word, Yeshua, Messiah. When Messiah's disciples were walking the Emmaus Road and puzzling over things Messiah had told them, Yeshua supernaturally appeared to them and said, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad. That's Luke 24, 17. The disciples recounted to him the recent events in Jerusalem, including the death of Yeshua and the empty tomb discovered by the woman there three days later. Then the Yeshua said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That means that all the prophets have taken from 315, the genesis of all prophecy, and carried the message forth of what all the prophets have spoken was going to come. Ought not Messiah have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. This passage is not only the key to prophecy, it's the key to understanding and interpreting the entire word of God. Beginning with Moses and the Old Testament prophets, right through to the book of Revelation, all the scriptures concern the revelation of Yeshua and Messiah, and God's plan of the ages is fulfilled through him. Therefore, there is no defense of any kind, of any way, shape, or form to disconnect the old from the new. Why would I want not want to know that in the Garden of Eden, God prophesied that one would be born who would overcome evil? The most hopeful presentation of a prophecy that man can have is that, yes, evil is powerful. And we have a powerful adversary, but God, God tells us from the beginning that we will be victorious through this promised seed of the woman. And then he sends us on a search through time. till we come to the realization of Yeshua.
how can you question the inerrancy of God's word and the interconnection between Genesis and every other book all the way straight through to Revelation? Whether it was man who organized it under divine inspiration or it was man who organized it under man's inspiration, the message is the same. We can question all we want, what was kept in, what was left out, but the message is the same. It's consistent and it's true and it never changes. It's a message revealing Messiah from the beginning all the way to the final victory. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back from this break, we'll join you on the other side as we continue in this teaching on the book of Revelation. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with more Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker right after this commercial break. People do some pretty cool things in their 40s and 50s. Why should saving for retirement be any different? I mean, they go back to college, learn new instruments, start skateboarding, Okay, maybe that one's not for everybody, but saving for retirement is. With aceyourretirement.org, you can get on track with your retirement savings no matter your age. Just have a three-minute chat with Avo, the friendly digital retirement coach from AARP. You'll get personalized recommendations based on your input that are easy to understand and work with your lifestyle. It's quick, easy, and free. Plus, it's sponsored by AARP, so you know they got your back. Gnarly move, Dad. Thanks, sweetie. So wherever you are in your retirement savings journey, head to aceyourretirement.org and start chatting with Avo today. That's aceyourretirement.org. A message from AARP and the Ad Council. Right now, our country feels divided, but there's a place where people are coming together. I got to tell you, I was nervous to talk to someone so different than me. Me too, but I'm glad we are. Love Has No Labels and One Small Step are helping people with different political views, beliefs, and life experiences come together through conversation. And it feels good. Wow, your story is so... uh, Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) When people actually sit down, talk, and listen to one another, they can break down boundaries and connect as human beings. At lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step, you can listen to amazing, life-changing conversations and find simple tools to start a conversation of your own. I know one thing. This conversation gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope, too. Take a step toward bringing our country and your community together by having the courage to start a conversation at lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step. A message from StoryCorps, Love Has No Labels, and the Ad Council. In the Garden of Eden, God spoke his first prophecy. Not much has been said or written about the eternal impact of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. What if every prophecy and even Jesus' return was tied to this prophecy and no one ever told you? Now you have a chance to read for yourself Rabbi Eric's latest book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. Featured on Skywatch TV, this book is a must-read. Get your copy at Amazon or from Skywatch TV. And don't forget to order The Codist, Rabbi Eric's prophetic biblical thriller exposing a diabolical plot to weaponize your DNA. And while you're at it, get his book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker, ready to take your calls at 850-660-9595. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, <clears throat> the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we are in the study on the book of Revelation. Once again, the phone lines are open at 850 660 Nine five nine five. We have a special gift for first-time callers, a signed copy of my new book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. You can get it on Amazon, on both Kindle and in paperback, as well at the Skywatch TV store in a special bundle. 
Uh, I would love to hear from you and take your calls with your questions. I know that uh, you have many things going on in your life and looking for someone to talk to. Uh, your call remains completely anonymous. If uh, you don't want me to use your name, don't tell me. Uh, for those who I recognize and who are calling because they are old friends and want to say hello, of course, I will address you by name. But let's get back in today's study because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm praying that you are seeing the importance of uh, uh, how God is using the book of Revelation to take us on this journey to understanding that from the very beginning, and I will tell you that 45 years in the synagogue, none of this was ever spoken of. We were given guidance as to how to live our lives and rules and regulations for how to operate in this complex world to be pleasing to God. But never once did I hear any conversation about a Messiah. But when I came to faith 25 years ago, and I began to read for myself, the connection points were crystal clear. And I feel like many of you have been cheated out of the opportunity to see the intricate tapestry, the intricate work that God has done to weave together a message that takes us through history of what was and what is and what is to come to see. It's all about the revelation of Messiah. That's it. The purpose of the Bible is to reveal Messiah to us. Why? Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Did God not know that he created man with a contrary spirit? Was God surprised by Adam's decision? He was not. This became the springboard for the entirety of the message. The same way I asked the question, what would have happened if all the Jews had accepted Jesus 2,000 years ago? There would be, the Gentiles would still be relegated to the core of the Gentiles. What if this had not happened in the garden and life was perfect? There'd be no story. There would be no reason, no compelling case built of the fallen nature of man and that there's nothing we can do. No matter how righteous we try to be and no matter how honorable we try to be. And I encourage you to be righteous. I encourage you to be honorable. I encourage you to be nice. I encourage you to love your neighbor. I encourage you to do all that, but all of it will fall short of the glory of God. So without the message of the revelation of Messiah. The hope of an afterlife of eternity with God is dashed. And so what's the fate of those that don't believe? Decay on the earth, from dust you are made, from dust to uh, dust you will return. Or is that an eternal separation from God, accountability and punishment for that sin? That's the negative argument that many use to persuade people to believe in God. But God has created the most positive argument for the acceptance of Messiah. He takes us on a long journey of almost 3,000 years 
of showing us that regardless of how much he provided for us, regardless of how much protection he provided, regardless of how much we were taken care of and defended by God, we still reverted back to our own fallen nature. But because he loves us, he gives us an exit, a path of redemption. That's the story of the Bible. It's for you to find Messiah. And to stop short with just the Old Testament and coming to the end of Second Chronicles, I was left hanging. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I was left hanging for 45 years. I was left hanging in the latter years when I began a real journey into saying and realizing after having achieved great success in the world. But I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. It was no longer things or a bank account or a multi-car garage or any of those things that brought real peace and real joy. And so I began to search. And I looked in a lot of places. And I learned a lot of really wonderful things about some really wonderful people. But it's what led me to Messiah. I had to be put in a position of discomfort and what I knew in order to look for a better answer. And I found it. And that's why many of you say, can you really talk about the Lord 24 hours a day, seven days a week? We do that right here on Revealing the Truth. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we bring you the message of Messiah. We do it by telling you about the prophets. We do it by telling you about Islam. We do it by telling you about the campaign in Armageddon. We do it by telling you about the Ezekiel 38-39 war. We do it by telling you about major characters in the Bible who dared to stand in the face of adversity. We do it in every way we can possibly conceive of and continue to do it because there's no end to how many ways that we will try to light the path for your understanding of who Messiah is and who we were introduced to in the Garden of Eden. The disciples recounted to him the recent events in Jerusalem, including the death of Yeshua and the empty tomb discovered by the woman three days later. They were distraught over it. Then Yeshua said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Messiah have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures concerning himself. This passage is not only the key to prophecy, it's the key to understanding and interpreting the entire word of God. Beginning with the Garden of Eden, and then with Moses and the Old Testament prophets, right through the book of Revelation, all the scriptures concern the revelation of Yeshua Messiah and God's plan of the ages as fulfilled through him. God contains in the book of Revelation a sevenfold blessing. You see, I believe that if we endeavor as feeble as it may be, even half hearted 
sometimes. Because if we pursue the word of God, there are blessings for us. The first of a sevenfold blessing is pronounced in Revelation 1 and 3 and expanded in the remainder of a book. As a child of God, each of these blessings are yours to claim. A blessing is pronounced upon those who read, hear, and keep those things written in the book of Revelation. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Revelation 1 and 3. This is why it's important for God's people to study and understand this revelation. Don't let people talk you into believing that it's not understandable. Don't let people convince you that if the, if the pastor wanted us to learn the book of Revelation, he'd teach it to us. One of the assignments that God gave as an everlasting assignment to the Jewish people was for us to protect the oracles of God. Meaning, to write them down, to preserve them, to pass them on from generation to generation. And when you think about how long they have endured before the printing press was even invented, and how today billions of Bibles are available. Anyone can get a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible, you need a Bible, contact us. We'll send you a Bible. And it will be our honor and our privilege to send you a Bible. As a matter of fact, if you're in need of a Bible, call right now, 850-660-9595, and I'll give you a double bonus. I'll send you a brand new Bible and a new copy, signed copy of my book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy, 850-660-9595. Second, a blessing is pronounced upon those who die in the Lord. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, 13. Third, a blessing is pronounced upon those who are spiritually diligent in keeping themselves from sin. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and may see his shame. Revelation 16, 15. Do you not see that this is pointing back to Genesis three fifteen? Adam, where are you? I heard you were walking in the garden and I hid because I was naked and afraid. It's right here. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He was ashamed. God is taking us through John and pointing us back to the beginning and saying, don't forget the beginning. Don't forget. And I'm going to remind you in the end what I told you in the beginning so you don't forget. Yes, it's been a long path to get here. Thousands of years to get here. But when you arrive, there's a blessing for you who are spiritually diligent in keeping themselves from sin. Number four, blessing is pronounced on those who partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 and 9. Number five, those who are part of the first resurrection of the righteous are blessed. First Thessalonians 4, 17. 
Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Messiah and shall reign with them a thousand years. Revelation 20 and 6. You know, over the course of time, as we grow older, you move from your 30s to your 40s, and, and you start thinking, oh, at 40, I'm getting older. And then you move in your 50s and your 60s, and all of a sudden you hit 70, and you begin to think about life. Uh, you have people coming at you. Do, do you have a living will? Do you have uh, a... Uh, uh, a uh, health care, uh, someone appointed in case you're not able to. And all of a sudden they're talking to you about all these things you need to have in place in preparation for your death. No, I'm not prepared to die mentally, emotionally, spiritually. But all swirling around me. I was at the cardiologist two days ago. from a one-year checkup from the stents that were put in. <clears throat> and it was a good checkup. And he ordered some more tests because he wanted to make sure that he has good baseline information. He wasn't looking for anything in particular, just to establish a baseline so that in the future, and in his mind, it was inevitable, to, inevitable that when something happens, we'll know from these tests what's changed. So that's why it's important to do these things. And I said to him, what if I don't believe that it's inevitable? What if I don't believe that what God spared me from will not endure until I take my last breath of natural old age? And he said, well, I can't force you. And he took that clinical and that, that um, doctor, the medical professional. I can't force you. I can't. I can only advise you and tell you that it's in your best interest. So he put down a list of tests and two of them I said, no, I'm not doing that. If we have no indication that something is going on, why would I want to go explore into an area where you're going to inject a foreign chemical into my system that my body is not designed to process to look for something that we don't think is there? I'm fine with some of the super, superficial sonograms and things like that, but going inside of me or putting dyes inside of me is not something that I'm going to volunteer for. Now, that's me not saying to you or giving you medical advice. I'm sharing my personal opinion only in regards to myself. Now, if I were exhibiting symptoms, if I were having a shortness of breath or pain of any kind, I would certainly be more aggressive about it, but I'm not. And so I'm using a much more holistic approach of supplements and, and lifestyle to counteract the effects of a life, yes, well lived, but not, not necessarily for my longevity. Blessing number six, those who keep the words of this prophecy who hold fast these truths and warnings are blessed. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, Revelation 22 and 7. Number seven, God's blessings. Are upon those who do his commands those who conform their lives to his word. Blessed are they 
that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates in the city. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that conform their lives to his word. I think we all struggle in many ways of evaluating ourselves and, and thinking that we have fallen short. But we must remember that God is faithful to forgive us our sins. And if it comes to our remembrance that we've done something or we thought something, or we didn't do something, we only need to God. We can do that in our daily prayer, in the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is a prayer asking for forgiveness. And if we ask for forgiveness, God is faithful for, to forgive. I know the tradition in certain denominations require you to recount specifically what the sin is. And in all honesty, I might not remember what the sin was, unless it was a major sin. But God knows. And if my heart is inclined to him that I want to do good, how do you think he felt when he heard Paul saying, I do what I ought not to do, and what I should do, I don't. What's he referring to? Is he putting himself before God as blameless and pure? No. He's fallen and he's broken. And he understands his lowly position, his humble circumstance. And so, should I endeavor to try to abide by God's commands? And yes, I should. And in many ways, I try. And in many more ways, I fail. And I know that you probably feel the same way. But that doesn't make you any less in the sight of God because he knows. He knew before you did it, before you thought it. Did he know that you would come to him to repent? Or is he like the hopeful parent that hopes his child makes the right decision, but when they don't, do they own up to it? Yes, I believe in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But I believe that's an everyday situation, not just a one-time salvation experience. I woke up today in Messiah, and therefore I am a new creation. And the new creation can only be judged by what the new creation does. The old creation is gone. The old has passed away. And this is the God that I serve. Who pours out grace and mercy and is extravagant in his love. And when I stand before that throne, my only 
response can be. I can only stand here because of the price paid for me, for my sin, for I am a sinner. And all of my righteousness is like filthy rags before you, O oh God. And it's not what I want, but it seems that that is the inclination of myself and many. We try to do good, but along the way, we make mistakes. With the billions of God's children over the course of from Genesis 1 to present day, is God caught by surprise by the actions of man? But by your acceptance in Yeshua Messiah, your sins are forgiven. Give all glory to God as we take a short break. We pray today's show blessed you as much as it did us and hope you will join us weekdays from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Replays of the show are available online at www.live365.com. Please email your questions and comments to Rabbi Eric at ignitinganation.com or on our social media platforms. Stay tuned for the second hour of Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. The phone lines are open at 850-660-9595. To some people, the sound of a baby babbling doesn't mean much. But that's not necessarily true. By six months, they're combining vowels and consonants. By nine months, they're trying out different kinds of sounds. And by 12 months, their babbling is beginning to take on some meaning. Especially if there's no babbling at all. Little to no babbling by 12 months or later is just one of the possible signs of autism in children. Early screening and intervention can make a lifetime of difference and unlock a world of possibilities. Take the first step at AutismSpeaks.org. A public service announcement brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. The following is made possible by Dad. Why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling all over it. <laughs> the Dad Joke. Corny, groan-worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. Why do you have to be careful when it's raining cats and dogs? Because you might step in a poodle. <laughs> and kids that spend more time with their dads grow up to be smarter, more successful. Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> and with any luck, funnier adults. Why didn't the skeleton go to the dance? Because he didn't have any body to go with. Dad jokes rule. So take a moment to make a moment and give your kid a laugh. <laughs> it's as easy as going to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. That's really funny. The program you are listening to is brought to you by Igniting a Nation, a 501c3 nonprofit ministry. We are 100% supported by your contributions. You can partner with us and support this program, our outreach in Kisi, Kenya, and our support of Israel. Visit us at www.ianbn.com and take advantage of access to thousands of hours of teaching. You can also donate there on our social media platforms. Your support is a blessing here, there, and everywhere. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker, ready to take your calls at 850-660-9595.
Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Taking your calls and the phone lines are open at 850-660-9595. And we encourage you to call in today. And we have a special treat for you, a signed copy of my new book, Waiting For You. Just give us a call, talk about anything, just say hello, and I'll be more than happy to send you a signed copy of that new book published by Skywatch TV Defender Publishing. Hope you like uh, some of the changes we've made here on the set as I've uh, finally dug in to a part of my new home that was the one that was the hardest to kind of uh, get a feel for as coming out of a television studio, how do you take a space and make it work workable for radio? And so I hope that, excuse me, I hope that the changes that we have made uh, are to your liking. So send a comment if you like, and uh, let me know what you think uh, that uh, uh, about uh, the new set. But we are in this study on Revelation. Uh, we want to make sure that we acknowledge our donors, you, uh, who support the program. And one of the ways you can support the program is to share on social media. Uh, share with your friends and followers and share on your websites and help get the word out. Uh, the algorithms on social media are stifling our reach and are making it so that uh, we um, are really not able to reach as many as follow us. And we have a sum total of over half a million followers, but I know that uh, uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them are never seeing the posts of these programs. And I can tell because we have over 3,750 YouTube videos out there and uh, about four and a half million views. And uh, I know that uh, our YouTube followers and those who are watching on YouTube uh, have the opportunity to share uh, and grab that clip, that, that link and share that link on your Facebook page, on your Instagram, on your Twitter, on your other channels to make people aware of this ministry. We've done great work uh, since we first came to Birmingham in 2005, led many people to the Lord and continue to lead people to the Lord by supporting uh, the message going out 24 hours a day, seven days a week as part of the media branch of igniting a nation. So you can do your part, not just financially. And of course, we will encourage you to financially give. And if you're giving, to give more. Uh, where our expenses in uh, launching this operation uh, exceeded, uh, they were in the range of what our fundraiser was for. But as you know, we fell short on that fundraiser. We thought about having another one, but we're looking to you who follow us to help us by organically getting the word out. And of course, any contribution you can make is greatly appreciated. I want to get back into this Revelation study because this, this is such an encouraging book of the Bible. Now, there are a lot of you that would argue and say, this is the apocalyptic literature. This is the apocalyptic chapter. This is the apocalyptic end of the world scenario that people have been talking about since Messiah coming. That the world as we know it will come to an end. And how can you be a proponent to say that this is the most encouraging book of the Bible? It's because as a believer, we win. We are victorious. We are overcomers. And we have been granted the right 
to eat from the tree of life and to sit at the right hand of Messiah and to worship God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Never need sleep, never deal with illness, never deal with sadness. But in this glorified body of pure light, I'm right there in the presence of God. That's as hopeful as you can get. John opens the book of Revelation by greeting and extending God's grace and peace to the seven churches which were in Asia. Grace be unto you, and peace from which he is, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Yeshua Messiah, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The major theme of Revelation is to bring God present God's people as a victorious church. That's good news. So we have the good news, which we call the gospel, the good news of Messiah, and now we have the greater news. Well, the greatest news is that faith in Messiah guarantees you victory. We have become a part of his victorious church. Integrated. We are one with Messiah. The seven spirits which are before his throne refer sorry I'm having a uh, little technical challenge here my computer is fighting me and I don't know what to do about it because it, it has locked up but there's always a backup plan and we will exercise that backup plan. But I am actually, there we go. Here we go. So the major theme of Revelation is to present God's people as a victorious church. The seven spirits which are before his throne refer to the Holy Church in the fullness of his ministry in the world and in the church. The spirit of the Lord, of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. In Revelation 1.11, John was instructed to write down all that was revealed to him by the spirit and send it to the seven churches in Asia. These seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, were located in the western part of Asia Minor. The revelations contained in this prophecy were given not only to comfort, strengthen, and encourage believers in the first century AD who were going through severe persecution but also to reveal the great final victory God has planned for us to prepare us for Messiah's coming and to strengthen believers coming down through the centuries. So it's a book for today. It's a message for today. As we are facing persecution, pestilence, famine, 
disease, poverty, inflation, God's word is to strengthen us as we come down through the centuries. Yes, they were going through a difficult time. Paul acknowledged all throughout his letters the difficult challenges that were facing those churches. And these same churches that he was writing to are the churches that these seven angels are speaking to, to give encouragement to. It's evident that the message, warnings, and admonitions contained in this book are not only for the early church, but are also meant for the entire church throughout the centuries. That means today. So rather than argue about the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws of Moses and the, and, and the Old Testament, should we not be focusing on the message of today? And the message of today is the revelation of Messiah's victory and that of his church over Satan, especially in the end times. Yeshua is revealed as the victor and conqueror over death, hell, the anti-Messiah, the false prophet, and all those who worship the anti-Messiah. The church is described as victorious, overcoming the power of Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The triumphant church is gathered out of all nations, and we see it standing united before the throne and before the Lamb. The church rules and reigns with Messiah upon the earth for a thousand years. Does this not encourage you? Does this not excite you? Does this not give you strength to face this day with new vigor and understanding that God has already secured your victory? That everything you're going through is temporary. Now, yeah, it hurts. And it's hard to wake up with a sore back and hard to get out of bed and Hard to face a day where you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. But this is not the end. And we have a hope that endures. I remember as a child sitting next to another little boy that when he opened his lunch bag, the only thing in it was an apple. I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I remember taking half that peanut butter jelly sandwich and giving half to him. You tell kids, hopefully still do things today. But we who are more fortunate than others can have that same kind of impact on someone else's life so that we are a messenger of hope. We can, in fact, be the living, breathing representation of God on earth in how we take care of widows and orphans and those in need. Yes, paying for the person's meal behind you. Picking up the check for a law enforcement or military person. Helping someone unload their cart at Walmart while they're struggling with a large box and offering to return the cart for them. Does that really cost you anything? But in our rush, 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 our busyness to accomplish what we set out to do and what our priorities are, we miss out on all the good that God has bestowed upon all of us to share. 
the gospel wasn't given unto you. The gifts weren't given unto you for you to keep to yourself. They were given to you to share, to multiply. That if you change the lives of one person, the life of one person, you've changed the world. And that person goes out and commits an act of kindness for another person, and that changes the world. Well, I can't go work at a polling place, and I can't go campaign, and I can't go do this, and I can't go do that. Can I be nice in the grocery store? Can I see somebody in an aisle next to me struggling to reach something and offer to help them? I see more crashes in the aisles of Walmart than I do on the highways in the bar. Because people are in such a hurry. They're so heads down, they're in such a rush. I'm just not that important. And so standing in the public's aisle, if I have a cart and you have four items in your hand, of course I'm going to let you go before me. Why would I be so selfish? But yet we don't think about. I'm not saying that because you don't do those things that you're a selfish person. I'm saying that you can be more aware. Being a believer to me is a position of high honor to be someone who's set apart to be the hands and feet of Messiah on this earth. I'm no saint. I don't know any saints. But I know people who try to do good for others. And imagine what a better place this would be if we weren't rushing down the highway in such a hurry that we cut people off or we tailgate or we drive too fast. We don't come to a full stop at a stop sign. We do a rolling stop and then we're angry because we got pulled over. It's as if the police officer did something wrong when in fact we're the offender. In, your, in John's opening salutation to the seven churches in Asia, he described, a, he described Messiah as the faithful witness. Yeshua bore witness to the truth from God. He said, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. In John 18, 37, the Greek word for witness is martyrs, which means one who suffers death for allegiance to a cause. Messiah is presented here in verse 5 as a model of how to endure faithful to the truth, even unto death. The firstborn of the dead, <clears throat> as the risen Messiah with victory over death, the firstborn of the dead, he is exalted as the head over the church and is given a position of authority over all things. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. <clears throat> so as an ambassador for Messiah, should we not conduct ourselves in a manner which is fitting as an ambassador of Messiah? The prince of the kings of the earth, because of Messiah's faithful witness and his victory over Satan and death, he now has a victorious position of supreme power and authority. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name 
that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 1 and 21. John used these three titles to encourage believers who were facing persecution and possible death to remain faithful as Messiah was faithful. And in so doing, they would also be victorious as he was victorious. Let's get real. The enemy is standing before us and threatening our lives. How confident are we in our faith? Are we not frightened? Are we not scared? Do we not want to die? That's only natural. But if deep down the seed is planted and the root goes so deep that it encapsulates the heart that we are victorious through Messiah, that you just might find that in the face of death, you have more faith than you could possibly imagine. I remember the story in Atlanta at the courthouse where that courthouse clerk was there with a gunman who had escaped and shot the bailiff. And she witnessed to him, knowing that it was in his intent to kill her. And finally, he laid down his gun and surrendered. Do I think that I could be someone like that? I'm not sure. I would like to think that I could be. I would like to think that I am. But until I face that circumstances, I won't really know. But I want to build myself up in the admonition of the Lord so that I can be equipped for that day. But that day of trouble is going to come, no matter how good our lives are. Whether it's adversity, or it's old age, or it's sickness, or it's whatever it is. The challenges that face us, do we face them with fear or with faith? And so the book of Revelation is not just an apocalyptic book to tell us about how the times are going to end and the final battle and how Satan is going to be defeated. It is to strengthen us and to give us hope as to the purposes of God from creation to the present time and until the return of Messiah that we should be able to stand firm in the promises of God because they are just and true. This is how John saw Yeshua. <clears throat> how do you see him? When you're faced with difficulties and trials, do you see him as a faithful witness? Do you rely on his word to see you through? Do you see him in a position of power and authority over every circumstance in your life? The keys to the kingdom have been given, given unto us. The power and authority over Satan has been given unto us. Excuse me. We are God's chosen, his beloved. And power and authority has been given unto us, and yet we walk around meek, fearful, and broken. 
No wonder we have a government that runs roughshod over us. No wonder we have voices that are loud, that we're afraid that they call us names. And we don't want to be singled out and persecuted. But this is the strategy of the enemy is to get you singled out, separated from the pack like he does in the wild kingdom. So if the lion can separate the weak one from the pack and the pack goes on, then the weak one is left to be devoured. But if the pack remains intact, the lions don't attack. We need to start acting as one unity. This message will go forth until I no longer have breath. That the enmity that exists between Jew and Gentile, the breach that exists between man to man, must be repaired in order for us to be at all pleasing to God and for us to accomplish any of his purposes. John also describes Yeshua as the one who loved us, has washed us from our sins in his own blood, has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. The word king speaks of authority, and the word priest means that we have open access into God's presence at any time. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as weak, struggling, and unable to overcome? Or do you see yourself as greatly loved, a king and priest with access into the throne room of God? And if you don't see yourself with the access to the throne room of God and greatly loved and a king and a priest, then it's time for you to try it on. Not in pride and to be prideful but to be empowered, to be victorious. This is the price that was paid, not just for the forgiveness of your sins, but for you to receive the keys to the kingdom. It's so much more than we present it to be. We've come time for our next break as we come to the end of our for the beginning of our last half hour of today's show, and we'll be back in three minutes and 18 seconds. And thank you for indulging us these commercial breaks. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with more Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker right after this commercial break. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Okay, men, this is your time. Maybe you didn't choose this, but you're here now. You're going to go out there and be an all-star caregiver. It's up to you. So what are you going to do? You're going to go grocery shopping, cook, clean, be there emotionally and physically. You got to dig deeper. 
drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments. Don't you forget about the pharmacy. No, you won't. Because that's what caregivers do. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. This is your time to show the world, your family, and yourself that you're tougher than tough. Now go out there and be the best caregiver this world has ever seen. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. In the Garden of Eden, God spoke his first prophecy. Not much has been said or written about the eternal impact of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. What if every prophecy and even Jesus' return was tied to this prophecy and no one ever told you? Now you have a chance to read for yourself Rabbi Eric's latest book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy. Featured on Skywatch TV, this book is a must-read. Get your copy at Amazon or from Skywatch TV. And don't forget to order The Codist, Rabbi Eric's prophetic biblical thriller exposing a diabolical plot to weaponize your DNA. And while you're at it, get his book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Here's your host, Rabbi Eric Walker, ready to take your calls at 850-660-9595. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we talk about the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Our phone lines are open at 850-660-9595. Don't forget to support our great sponsors, the Don Burt team. Look at them up at teamburt.com and Navarre Chiropractic Center. Uh, if you have any need for physical adjustment, you're dealing with any kind of chronic pain, they can help you tremendously. And if you're looking for uh, opportunities here to invest in property or to relocate, to, excuse me, through the area, then please give Dawn and her team a call. They have uh, an amazing uh, wide reach from uh, way past Pensacola uh, all the way out to 30A and beautiful properties, uh, affordable, uh, working within your budget, whatever it is that you are looking for, they can help you. So visit them and support them, and we appreciate that. So we were talking about how you see yourself. Do you see yourself as a king and a priest? Do you see yourself as an overcomer? Do you see yourself as someone who's been washed from sin? Do you see yourself as a king and a priest? Right at the beginning of Revelation, John gives us the divine promise of Messiah's return to earth. In Revelation 1.7, he said, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. This truth is the great hope and expectation of all true believers today, and it's the theme of Revelation. The death and resurrection of Messiah and the promise of his second coming are the foundation of our hope. They were a great source of strength to the early church and are even more so to us today as we move into the final days of time before Messiah's return. Now we've talked about this before, that every generation has thought that they were going to be the generation to see the Messiah. But God has a timeline And he's laid out that timeline in his scripture. No one knows the day or the hour, but we can look at the events as they line up. But while we are waiting, how distracted have we become with a variety of theologies that keep us from preaching the gospel? To preach the gospel with the promise that you won't endure tribulation. 
It was not the gospel at all. The gospel is that Jesus died for your sins. And that because of his death and his shed blood and his sacrifice, your sins are forgiven. There are innumerable blessings that come from that. And if we focus in on just one of those areas, are we missing out on so many of the other areas? This verse reveals that Yeshua will return in the same manner in which he ascended into heaven. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight from Acts 1 and 9. As the disciples gazed into the heavens where Messiah had gone, two angels announced that he would return in the same way he had ascended. We've seen this before. This is not some new <clears throat> magic trick that God's going to do. Elijah, a chariot of fire. Enoch was no more. Jesus not being in the tomb. God is reinforcing his message because if he tells us once, he's just told us once, does it become memorable? If he tells us twice, is he reinforcing it? If he tells us three times, is he trying to hammer it home that we know that we know that we know? As the disciples gazed into the heavens where Messiah had gone, two angels announced that he would return in the same way that he had ascended. They said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Yeshua, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. These are not proposals or, or possibilities. These are profound statements of fact. There's no ifs ands or buts about it, it establishes it true. This reminded them of what Yeshua had taught them, revealing that immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. One story of the promised Messiah who came as God said he would come, who died as God said he would die, was resurrected as God said he would rise from the dead, who walked this earth for 40 days and was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses, who ascended into heaven with the promise that he would send one to comfort us while we wait. And that was the Holy Spirit. Over 500 years earlier, the prophet Daniel saw Messiah's second coming in a vision. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son, <clears throat> excuse me, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there were given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. That's Daniel 7 13 to 14. 
Sound familiar? It should. At Messiah's second coming, he will gather his bride to himself and reward the faithful. But as we will learn further on in our study, he will also bring judgment upon the wicked and will tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 19.15 This is why it's important for us to be ready. This is why we must have an urgency within our spirits to warn those who continue to reject Messiah and his word. Once Messiah returns to this earth, there will be no more time for repentance. While we have breath, we are to be about sharing. Following the words of the greeting and encouragement to the churches, John explained how he received his vision. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Yeshua Messiah was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Yeshua Messiah. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as, a, as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia under Ephesus, and under Smyrna, and under Pergamos, and under Thyatira, and under Sardis, and under Philadelphia, and under Laodicea. Revelation 1, 8 to 11. John identifies with the suffering believers by referring to himself as their brother and companion in tribulation. And then he describes the place where he received the revelation, exiled and alone on the Isle of Patmos. Can't you just visualize John standing there on the Lord's day, alone, forsaken, cold, and weary? The sound of the howling wind echoes through the Rocky Mountains. The waves crash upon the deserted, jagged shoreline. But as John begins to worship God, something supernatural occurs. Suddenly, he hears a voice behind him as loud and clear as a trumpet declaring, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Messiah was describing himself as beginning, as being the eternal, complete revelation of God. And he was commanding John to write what he would, he would see in a book to be preserved for the church. When John turned to see the source of the mighty voice making the declaration, Yeshua Messiah, in all his power and glory, was unveiled before his eyes. John saw into the realm of the spirit and was so overcome at Messiah's awesome, awesome presence that he was fearful and fell at his feet as though he were dead. I think we can all identify with that reaction. Along with Peter and James, John had previously received a glimpse of Messiah's glory when he was transfigured. John had seen Messiah's face shine as the sun and his raiment white as the light. But now John saw Yeshua in the fullness of his glory and it was totally overwhelming. Messiah was wearing the robe of the high priest. John stayed to his clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with the golden girdle. In the Old Testament, the high priest wore full-length robes with a girdle made of fine linen, embroidered with needlework, secured around their waist. In this vision, Messiah had on the robe of a high priest, but the girdle he wore around his chest was made of gold, which denotes the dignity of an important office and signifies his office as our great high priest. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. 
Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. Messiah's hair was a white like wool. His white hair is symbolic of his title, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Messiah is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. When the prophet Daniel had a similar vision, he also described him as having hair like pure wool, raiment white as snow, and eyes as a flame of fire, Daniel 7, 9 to 14. Messiah's eyes were as a flame of fire. This description is also found in Revelation 19, 11, and 12, where Messiah is pictured as judge and conqueror over the anti-Messiah and the nations of the earth who have gathered together for the battle of Armageddon. His eyes of, si of fire symbolize perfect discernment. Messiah's feet were like undefined brass. Brass is strong, purified metal, which results from intense heat, denotes the purity and power with which Messiah will bring judgment upon the ungodly of the earth. Messiah's voice was as the sound of many waters. The voice John first heard in his vision was described as a great voice, as the sound of a trumpet loud and clear. In this verse, John describes Messiah's voice as the sound of many waters, which is similar to the description given by the prophet Ezekiel in 43 and 2. His voice is a mighty, powerful force. Out of Messiah's mouth proceeded a two-edged sword. The sword represents the power and authority of Messiah's words by which the world will be judged. And those aligned with, the, with Satan and the anti-Messiah will be defeated. Messiah's countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The powerful light surrounding Messiah was so blinding that John compared it to the powerful rays of the sun and all its strength. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8, Paul tells us that Messiah would destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. Later on in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, John tells us that in the new Jerusalem, there'll be no need of the sun, for the Lord God will be our light. We talked the other day about his word, which is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. That's God's word illuminating our lives. We serve a God we cannot see, but we can hear because God is spirit and spirit is light. And when we receive our glorified bodies, we will be pure light. Paul tells us Messiah would destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. How do you see Messiah? Do you see him as a babe in the manger? Do you see him only as he was when he lived upon the earth 2,000 years ago? Or do you see him as he really is today, seated in power and majesty at his father's side? I wonder every year at Christmas when I see the nativity scenes and the discussion of the baby, the baby, the baby, the baby, the baby, the baby. And we go back 2,000 years and we remember the birth of the child and the prophecy being fulfilled. But are we embracing the power and the majesty and the authority of Almighty God for the power and life and death of Messiah. You may have heard about Yeshua all your life. You may even be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, but have you really received a revelation of him, a drawing away of the veil of darkness to see Messiah 
as he really is. How do you see Messiah? Is he the conqueror? Is he the victor? Is he the suffering servant that died on the cross? When you think of Messiah and you see Messiah in your mind's eyes, do you see the passion of the Messiah and his blood-stained rags on his back and him crucified? Or do you see him powerful, anointed? How do you see him? Because how you see him frames your faith. If you see him as victorious, you will be victorious. But if you see him as suffering, you will be suffering. His suffering has ended. And he has been raised unto heaven where he is not suffering. Where he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. And when the enemy comes and brings his charge against you, he is there to declare you innocent, covered by his blood. How much we long to see the picture that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 when he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his garment filled the temple, and the angels surrounding him were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with the glory. And now to picture Messiah seated right next to the Father on that throne and the angels circling. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts who was and is and is to come to bring us our victory. I'm going to end today's program leaving you with that question. How do you see Messiah? And now, let me bless you. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say, in this way, I'll put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the ironic benediction. Yevarecha Kadonai V'yismarecha. Ya'er Adonai Panavaleka Vikuneka. Yesar Adonai Panavaleka Vyasimilka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and Amen. Please stay tuned for these final announcements, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow as we bring you our edition of Revealing the Truth, Revealing Life will be tomorrow's topic. Until we see you then, shalom. The program you are listening to is brought to you by Igniting a Nation, a 501c3 nonprofit ministry. We are 100% supported by your contributions. You can partner with us and support this program, our outreach in Kisi, Kenya, and our support of Israel. Visit us at www.ianbn.com and take advantage of access to thousands of hours of teaching. You can also donate there on our social media platforms. Your support is a blessing here, there, and everywhere. This is the story of a very special woman. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician or an entrepreneur. Her knowledge was limitless and still is. She could also make monsters disappear, especially those that lurked in the shadows under the bed. Once, this woman put back together a teenage girl's broken heart, which had been shattered in a thousand pieces just by giving her a bear hug. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. 
Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources, at aarp.org caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting. A teenager. Learning the lingo. Today I'm going to help parents translate teen slang. Now, when a teen says something is on fleek, it's exactly like saying, that's rad. It simply means that something is awesome or cool. Another one is totes. It's exactly like saying, totally, just shorter. As in, I totes love going to the mall with Becca. Another word you might hear is jelly. Jelly is a shorter, better way to say jealous. As in, Chloe, I am like so jelly of your unicorn phone case. You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will think you're, um, rad just the same. To learn more, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Thank you for listening to Revealing the Truth with Rabbi Eric Walker. Join us tomorrow at 8 a.m. Central Time and give us a call at 850-660-9595. Full downloadable versions of all the teachings are available at ignitinganation.com. Don't forget to listen 24-7 for Revealing Life, Revealing the Bible, Revealing Prophecy, Revealing the Gospels, and more of Revealing the Truth. Download Igniting a Nation or listen on iHeartRadio. Until we see you right back here tomorrow, Shalom.